Welcome back to my channel for another bird painting tutorial. Today we're painting a Baltimore Oriole. If you've been following along with this series already, you know that I've designed and laid out nine different birds that I want to paint on this large 12 by 12 inch sheet of paper. And my Baltimore Oriole is going to be going in this right hand upper corner. My reference photo today is from Unsplash. I'll be sure to include a link in the description below so you guys can download that and follow along. If like me, you're working on a large sheet of paper with other birds that you're going to be painting on it, you're going to want to protect those from getting spattered on or drawn on. So I'm just going to lay down some paper towel to protect the rest of the paper. Although initially I might want to see them so that I can see better for where I'm placing my bird when I draw it on. But some tools you'll need today are paper towel, water jars, a pencil, and a watercolor brush. I'm going to be using my silver black velvet size 4 round brush. To capture the beautiful colors in this Baltimore Oriole, I'm going to be using my Gamboge Nova, which is a warm yellow. You could also use cadmium yellow. Any warm sunflower yellow will work perfect. And then for the orange in the belly, I'll be using Winsor Newton Transparent Orange. For the black of the bird, I'll be using Daniel Smith Indigo, or you can use Payne's Gray, any kind of dark color. And if you mix it with brown, it will neutralize and look like a dark black. I like mixing my blacks because it's more transparent and less murky looking. So to start out with the sketch, I've got my design already laid out. I also did a smaller design and as a thumbnail sketch on just a little post-it note earlier and I want to make sure that I have the placement correct so I'm going to have this handy as a guide for how large I want my bird to be. One of the reasons that I decided to put this guy in this corner was because he's his head is facing in towards the painting. I want our viewer's eye to be visually drawn around almost in a circle from one bird to the next and I want each bird to be kind of leading to the next. You can start by just doing a oval shape for the body of the bird. And if it starts out a little too large, don't worry, we can always make small adjustments. And then overlapping that oval is the head. So look at the black shape made by the head and try to draw that shape and a rough beak here. I'm looking at the negative space between this black area and the yellow spot. And then I'm also deciding how far this black marking comes back. There's a little indent with the yellow here and then the wing that's both black and white. And then the tail, very foreshortened, we can barely see it. It's just a little pokey shape over here. And the rounded belly. So we weren't too far off in our size assessment, but I am going to erase some of the excess markings from this oval. And since my initial sketch was very rough, it doesn't have to look exactly like this. But I'm going to set that aside now that I have the size marked out. And then we have these legs that are coming forward wrapping around a tree branch, his little toes. All right, so there's the rough size and placement. Now we're gonna go in and really study our reference photo and tighten up the drawing and make it something that we can feel confident going in with paint. So I'll start by the sketching the beak first. Being much more careful with my pencil marks. There's a little nostril here. And part of the eye is visible, just barely, along the left side. Pretty much the whole head is going to be dark and black. There's a little strip of lighter colored feathers along the top where the light is hitting it, but it's barely visible. And then there's this almost bib shape coming over the chest. And I'm really just trying to see the shape and what direction it's curving. Here along the belly, we draw a rounded shape. And with my other birds, I tried to leave little areas that were lost edges where the color almost disappears into the background. For our Baltimore Oriole, there are just a couple spots where this could be possible, such as along the back near the tail over here, because this is a much lighter area color and value wise, we can probably get away with losing that edge. So instead of rendering it, I'll erase it. That way I know for when I go back in with the paint that this is going to be a lost edge. And then along the top of the feathers here, I do want to be careful about marking out where the black feathers meet the white feathers. So there's a black stretch of feathers right here, and then a white strip of feathers, and then another little bit of black and then a few little separated feathers here. Nothing too crazy. Remember not to overdo it with details. This is an illustration. We want it to just be a whimsical, beautiful piece. 
It doesn't have to be an Audubon scientific study of each bird. Although if you want it to look like that, just spend more time on the drawing. All right, so there we've got our rough body shape. Let's locate where the eye goes and draw that in. It's gonna be important to paint around this little highlight on the top of the eye. So you might wanna mark that out ahead of time. And then last but not least, the little legs here. I'm not doing much on these sketches in the way of details in the feet. I'm just kind of painting little gray marks for the legs. I won't deviate from that too much with this drawing either. And then there is a branch that we'll have to paint just so he looks like he's sitting on something. But there we go, there's our sketch. I think we're ready to start painting. Once you have your sketch on, do cover your other paintings so you don't accidentally get paint splotches or splashes on them. So I'm protecting my paper and then I'm going to grab an extra paper towel for blotting over here. So important to have something on hand to help control how much water's in your brush. All right, first of all, make sure your brush is completely clean because we're going to be starting with the bright yellow color. For my yellow, I'm going to be using, as I said, Gamboge Nova, this Holbein color. It's a beautiful, brilliant yellow. So I'm going to mix some of that up and you know, I for some of these other paintings, I was going in wet and wet. Most of the time I like to start with wet and wet techniques, but for this one, I want my yellow to be as bright and brilliant as possible, and it's gonna go on in its purest form if I use a milky texture with my paint on dry paper. So we're gonna paint in all of the yellow and cover up the orange with this Gamboge Nova first thing, wet on dry. So if, to avoid any hard edges from forming, just use lots of paint, really load up your brush, and you're basically just covering and coloring in the whole shape of the belly. Bright yellow, look how beautiful that is. Almost blinding, it's so bright. And then we'll paint right up here where I said I wanted to lose an edge. I'll show you how I'm gonna resolve that in a second. So paint everywhere you see yellow. And then rinse that out. Rinse in a clean jar if you have another, if you have a second jar that's all clean, that'll help you really get your brush completely clean. Now remove most of the water so you should still have a damp brush. And gently scrub along that edge, removing and lifting some of the paint so that it looks like a lost edge just fading into the background. This painting it's a little harder to I think have lost edges in it because there's so many dark colors in it but we'll do our best. All right now I'm going to take my transparent orange. This is a Winsor and Newton color. You can also create an orange by mixing a cadmium red with a warm yellow. And we're going to go right over the top of that yellow wet on wet. Now remember, it's still wet because we just painted it. So this orange is going to soften out and disperse a little bit. You can paint it almost up to the edges of your yellow. Now as you approach this area in the light, if you're looking at your reference photo, you can see it gets lighter. So I'm gonna remove a little bit of paint but dry on the towel and then begin to spread the paint around over the yellow, remove some more. So it's just a very light tint on my brush, hardly any water, and it's softening into the light, gradually getting lighter. Now I'm removing almost all of it and pushing and pulling the paint ever so slightly up towards the yellow. Over here, there's a little separation in the body, so I'm adding a little more orange. And just like that, we've been able to paint this brilliant belly super quickly. In the reference photo, it's even a little bit darker. So if you wish to go darker, you could add a dark red, something like alizarin crimson. Just make sure you don't have any excess water in your brush or it will spread that paint out and cause a cauliflower. So it should be all pigment from your palette no excess water in your brush. And I'm just darkening that underbelly a little more. <laughs> it 
so pretty. All right, with that done, now we can work on the gray parts of the bird, such as the legs and the beak. Let's take our indigo, swirl it around on the palette. It might just be a beautiful color all by itself, and I think this will work if I add enough water to it. So I have a light gray, sort of a bluish gray, and I'll go ahead and paint the beak that color. And then we can do that for the feet. Just be careful not to touch your red or orange if it's still wet because that will reactivate that paint and cause it to seep into your gray. Okay, so there we have roughly painted on the beak and the legs. Now we need, everything else we need to do is pretty much black. So while this is drying, we can mix up our black I'm going to take transparent brown oxide and mix it with my Daniel Smith Indigo. And I'll go ahead and paint some shadow tones under these little toes. May have already dried by now. When you're working on dry paper, it does dry really fast. Wet and wet, it takes a little longer because you've soaked the paper ahead of time. The more you paint, the easier it will be to judge the drying time of your paper. And that can also depend on where you live. For example, I live in a really dry climate, so my paper dries quite quickly. Whereas if you live in a more humid location, your paper may not dry that fast, giving you more time to do wet and wet effects without having to re-wet. Okay, I'm gonna take this light grayish tone here. It's not really light, it's quite dark actually but it's gonna serve as my lighter value for the head. As I mentioned while we were sketching it, the top of the head and along the back here, they're catching the light. The sunlight is shining down on this black head, on the black feathers, and there is an area along the top that's a little lighter in value than the rest of the black markings. So this will serve as your lightest value within the black. Paint around that highlight in the eye. That's so important to preserve the white of the paper there. So really slow down for these details. And of course, as you're approaching the orange, if it's still wet, don't touch it with your brush or it will push aside that still wet paint, cause some problems. But if it's dry, you're safe to paint right up next to it. So I'm going to go ahead and paint with my indigo all the way inside of this marking, this black marking on the chest and along the top. That gamboge nova that we've painted first is definitely dry by now. Now with your black that's on your brush, you can begin to paint in between Along the top wing here, there's those distinctive black and white markings. So let's go ahead and use our indigo at its darkest value, or Payne's Gray if you have that. And I'm using a little bit of a dabbing motion with the brush to create the look of little feathers overlapping the yellow. You can do that on the underside of this shape too. So it looks a little bit fuzzy, like feather texture. So I'm really studying my reference photo for the markings here. I want to get these right. The wings are the most distinctive marking on this Baltimore Oriole, of course, besides the orange belly. And then you've got a black mark on the tail. The top feather is dark. I'm going to rinse that out most of the way and swipe along the top of the tail feather with a tiny bit of water to get it loosened up so it's a lighter value across the top. Painting a little bit of texture on the feet while I have that gray on my brush still. Little side, side by side parallel brush strokes showing the texture. Okay, now we need to go back into the head with a darker value, mixing up more indigo and transparent brown oxide for black. So much pigment, very little water here. And now we paint the head again, this time at its darkest value. Careful underneath the beak.
And just like we did with the wing feathers, if you want to add a little bit of texture, you can do that almost like fur overlapping the chest where this black feather on the head meets the orange. Add a little bit of texture. Don't just do one straight line across. That won't look as realistic. And then leave a little strip of light along the back where you had already painted that first layer of gray so that it looks like it's shiny. Same with the top of the head. Leave a strip of light along the top. Painting right up to that and then filling everything in as dark as possible. When you get to the eye, slow down, really take your time painting around it. And then you can fill it in, weaving that little highlight. He looks a little startled. Maybe adjust the shape of your highlights. You can make them slightly smaller. So I'm going to remove most of the paint. My brush is now just damp and I'm going to lift just a little bit back out around the outside edge of the eye. You might need a stiffer bristled brush for this. But I lost that little bit of highlight there so I'm lifting it back out and then I can restore the shape again using the pointed tip of my brush. Yeah. And then I'm going to outline the shape of the mouth one more time. I think this bird is unusual from the rest of the birds that I've chosen. He's got his mouth open a little bit. Okay, the last thing will be to, well, two things left. We're going to add a branch underneath him. The color I used for my other birds so far was transparent brown oxide, so we might as well stick with that. Maybe mix in a little of the indigo to neutralize it. And I'm just going to paint the shadow side of the branch first. Dip in the water so it goes smoothly for me here. And I'm going to paint it really roughly, letting my brush scrape along the surface of the paper, catching on the texture. And then I'm going to twist my brush upward in this curved motion, mimicking the shape and curve of the branch. We'll have it come down a little bit like that off the paper even. So let's see how that looks with the other birds. So bright and colorful. Now I'm going to add some orange spatter just like I did with my cardinal here. Once again cover everything else up with paper towel to protect it and then I'm going to take my transparent orange swirling it on the palette ahead of time having it nice and wet in my brush. This is the one time I'll say use plenty of water in your bristles and then gently tap across the painting wherever I want a little bit of spatter. I'm going to take a look again and see what I want to add. I think I'm going to do a couple of these individual little circle shapes underneath the composition. Maybe one right there. What fun to paint with such bright colors. There's the finished Baltimore Oriole. I'm so happy with how he turned out. I don't paint with bright colors very often because I do a lot of organic, natural, animal-looking things. <laughs> so this was a really fun departure from the usual. If you're following along with this series, be sure to check out the previous two videos about the cardinal and the tufted titmouse. You can find links to that below. And if you like my style of teaching and want to take your skills to the next level, check out my Watercolor Mastery membership. Thanks for watching today, and I'll see you in the next video.